confidence in that fact, no matter what we face tomorrow, no matter what we face today, you have been faithful through the past, so you'll be faithful with the future. God, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You never change. We do sometimes, but you don't. So God, we can put our confidence, we can put our faith, we can put our trust in who you've always been because it's going to be who you always will be. And Lord, we pray this morning as we open up your word that our hearts and our minds and our lives will be open to hear from you. God, we need to hear from your word and your spirit. We pray that it would convict us, that it would challenge us, that it would change us, that it would make us more like you. We need to be more like you, God. We need you, God. Come and do what only you can do, we pray. And in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. to see you guys today. Got a quick question for you this morning. Have you ever known anybody in your life? You've encountered them. They're your family. If they're in this room, don't look at them. But somebody who is ungrateful. You know somebody is ungrateful. So if you don't, you might be the one who is ungrateful. You know, that, that, that person that you've done so much for and you, and you do this thing and you're so nice and you go out of your way, maybe you sacrifice for them, you did all of this and they're like, uh, but that was nice, but I want you to do this. I, I want more, I want more, I want more. And you, you try and you try and you try, but it's just never enough for them. They're just ungrateful. That's almost how I feel about this section of scripture. The Israelites have seen God do so much. He's come through time and time and time again. He's done so much for them. It's only been 30 days since God set them free from slavery. Now remember this. They were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. So their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, they were all slaves in Egypt. And now here they are. They're, they're free. It's only been a month. It's only been 30 days. And in those 30 30 days, they saw miracle after miracle after miracle. I mean, a cloud is guiding them by day, a pillar of fire by night. That's pretty awesome. God parted the Red Sea. He took out Pharaoh's army, and then they were thirsty. Like, oh, the water's bitter. Okay, I'll make it sweet for you. God does all of these things. They move to Elium where there's springs and there's palm trees. It's this oasis. And now they're going through this desert. This desert called Sin, on their way to Mount Sinai. And all of this is to bring them to the promised land. But remember, it's only been 30 days since God has set them free. And yet we see time and time again, all they do is grumble. All they do is complain. It's never enough. God, where are you? That sound like us sometimes? God, you've done so much for me. You've come through time and time again. I mean, think about your own life. How many times has he saved you? How many times has he rescued you? That doesn't even count the how many times he, he saved you from a disaster you didn't even know was going to happen. And yet, when something unexpected happens, our first reaction way too many times is this. God, where are you? God, do you see me here? God, am I all alone? We, how could you let this happen? The truth is we haven't made much progress since the Israelites. Too many times we, 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 we jump to God, where are you? But maybe today, hopefully today, 
we can take a step forward in our faith. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Exodus chapter 16. It's the second book of the Bible. So if you get to Genesis at the very beginning, go to Exodus. If you don't have a Bible or an app on your phone or your tablet, there is a Bible in the seat back in front of you. You can keep that as a gift from us to you. We believe this is the Word of God. So primarily how we teach at Restoration Church is by going through books of the Bible. We've been going through this book for a number of weeks. We're going to be in it for a while. So if you don't have a Bible, take that home. Read. Check it out. Make sure that what I'm saying is actually in here. Make, read before what I read. Read after what I read. Make sure that I'm taking it in context. So Exodus chapter 16, verse number 1. They set out from Eliam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. Now again, that is the literal name of this desert. That's how it's translated into English. It's not a metaphor for something which it could be actually, but it's, it's not. It's just the name. The desert is called Sin, which is between Eliam and Sinai. On the 15th day, on the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by meat pots and ate bread till the full, for you have brought us into the wilderness to kill us, kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now again, got to get this picture. I'm sorry. I keep going back to this. But I want you to see this. I want you to connect these dots. They were slaves for 400 years. And God does miracle after miracle after miracle to set them free. It's been a month. And what are they doing? They're sitting around camp going, the good old days. Oh, remember back in the good old days when we were slaves? Yeah, we had no freedom. Yeah, they beat us if we didn't make enough bricks. Yeah, we had to do whatever they told us to do, but we had food. Oh, the good old days. See, let me tell you something about our past. Your past is never as good as you shape it to be. Your good old days weren't really that good. For those of us who have been out of high school for a amount of time, for a little while— the, the longer you're out of high school, the better you were in high school. You didn't make the freshman team, but let you tell the story. You were the star of the whole thing. The longer you were out, the better you become. Those are the good old days. We look at pictures now that we're older and go, oh, I remember back when I was in shape. Oh, I remember when I looked like that. I remember, oh, the good old days. But the truth is this, you didn't think that about yourself then. And you teenagers now, someday you'll look back at your social media, if we still have that 20 years from now, and you look at your pictures and go, oh my gosh, when I was in high school, when I was in high school, I looked like this, I had all these things. The truth is, but today when you look in the mirror, all you see is the things you wish you could change. See, the good old days aren't so good. It, it's not, it, it, we reshape it, we remake it because we, we don't like who we are today. We don't like our situation today. So we go back to the past and we pretend, we make believe, we reshape a story so that our past is better than our today. Yet it was not. See, here's the truth. Life is hard. Every season of life is hard. It doesn't matter if you're 12 or you're 92. Those seasons of life will be difficult. And here's why. Because we live in a messed up world. And this messed up world is going to be hard. It's going to hurt. It's going to fight against us. We're going to struggle as long as we're in this world. Until we get to the promise of what is to come, we're going to go through some deserts. We're going to go through some difficult times. There's going to be some struggle. But maybe, just maybe, we can learn to trust God. Maybe, just maybe, we can progress and stop looking back and stop the back and forth. And maybe, just maybe, we can grow in every season of life. Maybe we can learn to have joy in every season of life. Look at verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. 
Now, please get this. God has done so much for them already. But now they're saying, oh, but back in the good old days, we had food. Oh, we were slaves, but we can sit at the meat pot and we can eat. And God's like, yeah, 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 I hear you. I see what you're doing here. I'm going to bring you food. It's going to be better than Uber Eats. Like, I'm going to bring you food. I'm going to deliver to you every single day at the right time. You're going to get food in the morning. You're going to get food in the evening. I'm going to take care of you. It's going to rain bread. And all the keto people get nervous. I, I, carbs, I don't know. Can I do I, oh, meat, meat in the evening? I'm a vegetarian. Look, look, just eat the food God gives you, okay? And so God's like, I'm going to bring you food every day. It's going to be awesome. Twice a day you're going to eat, and you're going to have enough for every single day. And look at verse 5. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So here's the thing. Here's the, here's the instructions. So five days you're going to go and you're going to collect enough for you and your household, enough for you and your tent to feed you for that day. On the sixth day, you're going to go and you're going to collect double. Enough for today and for tomorrow because God's going to do something with that seventh day. He's going to do something in such a way that's going to be a blessing to them. So you're tracking with me. Those are the instructions. Not that difficult. Look at verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that we, yet your grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, in the morning bread to be full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing. Fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What given you to eat? This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather it, each of you, as much as you can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some, some more, some less. But they measured it out with an omer. Whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. Everyone had enough. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it till morning. Pretty cool, right? God, I'm hungry. We had food when we were slaves. And God's like, watch this. Here's come some birds, and you're going to have meat, and you're going to have bread. It's going to be so awesome. If this was in 2019, we have our phones out. We'd be going live on any social media thing that you'd be doing, taking selfies. Look at me in the bread. We'd be so excited. We'd be showing everybody. But just like social media, we'd still have all these insecurities inside. We pretend like, oh, this is so great. Oh, this is so awesome. But what about tomorrow? Oh, I feel so good right now. Look how awesome this is. God came through. God's my bestie. But tomorrow, do I trust him? Again, the instructions were easy to understand. Take enough for the day. Some of you eat more than others. Fine, take enough. Take all you to the tent, but eat it all this day. Don't take anything extra. Don't leave anything until morning, Moses said. I love verse 20 because I can relate to it sometimes. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till morning. Oh, it's just, just a little snack for the morning. But what happens to it? 
and it bred worms and stank. You know stank was in the Bible, did you? It is right there. It bred worms and stank. It says stank. And Moses was angry with them. Yeah, go figure. Moses is going to be upset. He said, easy instructions. Take all you can eat and eat till you're full. But don't leave anything till morning. But they didn't listen. I'm just going to save a little bit. And also the next morning, it's got worms. Oh, it's nasty. And it's stinking. Oh, that's gross. So all you parents, all you employers, all you teachers, look, your instructions were clear. <laughs> it wasn't a problem with the instructions. The instructions were easy to understand. The problem is us on our human nature. We always think we have a better plan. We always think the rules don't apply to us. Oh, that's for the tents down the street. We'll save some. What's, what's the worst that's going to happen? Yeah, your tent's going to stink. And you're going to hear a scream in the morning because your wife's going to come out and you go, worms, that's not cool. What's the worst that can happen? See, look, guys, you need to understand something. The rules do apply to you. When God gives us instructions, he means what he says. This is how you should live. This is what you should do. This is what it looks like. But, but I see it a little differently. You know what? God didn't ask you how you saw it. He's taking care of you. He's trying to bless you. He's trying to love you. Do what he says. Look at verse 21. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord had commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till morning. So they laid it aside till morning as Moses commanded them. And it did not stink. Why? Because God said to it, now keep it. And there was no worms in it. Thank God. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find in the field. Six days you shall gather it. On the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. Again, clear instructions, right? We can get this. Seventh day, have leftovers from, just keep double for, six, for the sixth day. And then don't go out on the seventh day. Rest. They didn't get it. Verse 27, on the seventh day, some people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. There is something we need to see here before we move on. Why did God give the people the Sabbath in these verses? In a few chapters, we're going to see the Ten Commandments. And we're going to see that the Sabbath is a commandment. This is before any of that. It's not a commandment yet. Why did God give them a Sabbath, not a trick question. He gave it to them for a day of rest. How many of you would like to get some rest this week? Just raise your hand. Remember when I was young, we had nap time Sunday afternoons and I hated it? Now I'm like, can I have nap time, please? Like nap, a nap would be marvelous right now. God's saying, I want to bless you. I want to take care of you. I want you to rest. These people had been traveling. They had worked hard. They were slaves. They were farmers. They had to take care of animals. Those of you who grew up on the farm, you know that there is no rest days on the farm. You have to go feed the cows. You have to go do something. There's always work to be done. These people live those kind of lives. And God said, I understand. You work hard. You do all this. I'm going to give you a day of rest. What a blessing. 
See, you got to understand this. When God gives instructions, it is for your good. He's not being mean. He's not trying to just control you, manipulate you. He's not trying to stop you from having fun. He's trying to help you. Where there is no instruction, there is no love. For my kids, if I let them go and do whatever they wanted to do, I would not be loving them. But because I love them, I give them instruction. Here's what you need to do. Here's what's right. Here's what's wrong. This is okay. This is not okay. It's not me being mean. It's not me trying to control them. It's me trying to bless them. It's me trying to help them be a good person. Me trying to help them do well in society. Me trying to help them know God. It's me trying to help them because I love them. When God gives you instructions, he is doing it because he loves you and he wants what's best for you. He doesn't want you to have this hurt and this pain and these regrets and all this other baggage we take through our life. He wants to help you be free and stay free and not have regrets. He's trying to bless you. But we don't see it that way. We look at the Bible and says, don't do this, don't do that. Well, God, my situation is a little bit different. That doesn't apply to me. Well, God, you forgive me. (sighs) Yeah, he will. But it wasn't about forgiveness. It was about you going through some pain you didn't have to go through if you would have just followed the instructions. But we take a blessing from God. And we, we, we mess it up. We either ignore it or we try to control it. So we say, oh, we don't need a Sabbath. Oh, I'm tough. I have energy. I don't need a, I don't need a break. Okay, tough guy. You, you have no break and see what happens. Have no rest and see what happens. That's one response. The other response is this. I'm going to control it. If we're going to have a Sabbath, it better look like this, it better sound like this, it better have, we add all of these rules to God creating something that's just there to be a blessing. See, we take a blessing and then we make it a point of contention. God says do this. God says worship him. Simple instruction, right? Right? But yet, how many churches today have contention and fighting over how we worship God? We take a blessing and we make it a place of division. There is no reason for that. We take a blessing and we make it a curse. Think about the Garden of Eden all the way back in the beginning. God creates this beautiful place. No pain, no disease, no hurt. God gives simple instructions. Eat from any of the trees that you want. Eat it all. It's good. It's awesome. It's so, you're going to love it. There's just one tree. Just don't eat from this one. This one. Everything else you can have, it's going to be so good for you. I want to bless you. I'm trying to love you. It's all there. It's going to taste so great. But this one tree, don't eat from this one tree. And what do we say? Oh, Adam, oh, this tree looks pretty good. And the devil's like, yeah, it is pretty good. If you eat of it, you'll be like God. You know good and evil. All you know now is good. Oh, what's evil? I don't know what evil is. So we eat of the, God blesses them. He blesses them with this place. He blesses them with provision. He blesses the one instruction, don't do this, and we can't take it. And we go, oh, I got to, I just got to do my thing. I got to know what God does, what God doesn't want me to know. I got to do what God doesn't want me to do. And we take of something that was supposed to be a blessing for us, this place, and we turn it into a curse. That's what we do so many times with the blessings of God. He's saying, look, I'm creating a structure. I I know you get tired. I know you get wore out. I know that life is hard. So I'm going to create a time of rest for you. But you fight over it. You try to control it. You add rules to it. You ignore it. And what's supposed to be a blessing now becomes a curse. And we're walking through life, and it's hard, and it hurts. And we feel like we're in a desert. 
Show that picture, if you would, of the trail they're walking. This is a literal picture from Google Maps. There's Elium in the bottom left corner. It's the oasis we talked about last week. Beautiful place. There's Mount Sinai. And, but to get to the promise, to get to Mount Sinai even before the promise, they have to go through the desert. That's a long, dry walk. You wouldn't choose to walk through the desert. We don't want to walk through the desert. But sometimes life is just a desert. Maybe not a literal desert like the Israelites, though it feels like that outside today. But a dry season where you feel like you're just struggling, you're just tired. And we asked the same question the Israelites did. God, where are you? He is there. So understand a couple things about the desert. Just because you're in a desert doesn't mean you did anything wrong to get there. Now, if you rob a bank and you get caught and you go to jail, you're like, this jail is my desert. Okay, you did something to get there. But most of the time, deserts just happen because life is hard. Deserts just happen because it's part of the journey. For the Israelites, he's taking them to the promise. But the promise takes them through the desert. Guys, we have a promise of something to come. But for us to get there, sometimes we got to walk through the desert. You didn't do anything wrong for it to happen. You're not a bad person because you feel like you're dry. You feel like God's not speaking to you. You feel, you feel all, you didn't do anything. You're just in the desert, but keep on going and know that he is there. Trust him. He will walk with you. He will, he will care for you. He will take care of you. But when you're in the desert, he might only give you what you need for the day. And we don't like that. And neither did the Israelites. They wanted to store up for tomorrow. Why did they want to store up for tomorrow? Why were they, why were they going out to store up extra and became worms and it, and it stank? Not because they wanted to have more rest. On the seventh day, the rest day, they went out too. The reason why they were storing up, because they didn't trust that God would show up the next day. What if God's late? What if God forgets? What if God's delayed? I'll, I don't know. I'll store up here on day two. Let me store up enough for three and four because just in case God doesn't come through, just in case we'll have something to eat. So let me store this up and let me save it. The real reason why they stored up the food because they didn't trust God. And that's our story too. The truth is this, God wants you to go to him every single day. He creates this table. It's a beautiful table where you can come and partake and you can eat and you can grow and you can know him and you can be in fellowship with him. You come every single day to be a part of his table. But we take it and we store it up and we go, oh, that was a really good meal last week. Justin did a really good job. We had a, a really good meal. This will, this will keep me going for a month. No, it won't. It was good for the day. Then you got to go back tomorrow, then on Monday, and you got to eat again. And you got to eat again. We try to pull out the leftovers, though. Oh, let's reheat this. Let's, where's the microwave? That was really good last week. That was really good last month. Or oh, I remember that one time when God showed up. Oh, it was so good. And we're trying to reheat it. We're trying to warm it up. We're trying to eat it again. But there's no nourishment anymore. It's just a memory. It's just a, oh, remember when? It's, there's no strength in it for today. It was only for that day. But we don't go back to the table. We don't go back to God saying, God, I need you today. God, help me today. God, be with me today. 
I, I, I'm going to tell you something today, and it's, and, 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 and it's going to change the last couple of weeks as the fair leaves town, and the chief started two minutes ago. I'm sorry. <sighs> this season of the year is one of my busiest seasons of the year, any year, every year. And here's why. My counseling appointments go through the roof when school starts. And people get back to their normal schedules and the fair leaves time. It goes through the roof. Do you know why? Because everybody was gone all summer. Doing good things, not bad things, good things, things I want you to do. Going on vacations and doing things with your family, all these good things. They're not wrong, they're not bad. You should do them. But here's the problem, you weren't eating. You weren't eating. You were, oh, uh, you know, we're gone this week. Like, as, as if we can't take the Bible and eat. We don't take, I'm on vacation, so and during vacation, I don't, I don't need, I'm just going to leave my Bible. I'm just going to leave all this at home. I'm on vacation. Look, look. I don't get a vacation from my spouse, nor do I want one, by the way. <laughs> I got I to gotta put that in there real quick. I might get in trouble. <laughs> Hold on. You look. Just because you're on vacation doesn't mean you get one from your spouse if you're married. Just because you're on vacation, you don't get a vacation from God. Why would you want one? He can meet you in the Caribbean. He can meet you at the lake. He can meet you at the farm. He can meet you wherever you are. Why don't you just go and eat every single day? But we don't. So we come back and the devil's been pounding on us. He hasn't been letting up. He's going, 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 and you're hungry. So you come back grumpy. You need a Snickers bar, like just chill out a little bit. But you come back grumpy. You come back beat up. You come back all these things. Oh, oh, Scott, I need you. I need you. And you know what? I want you to come to me, and I will help you, and I will guide you through. But I'm telling you, the problem. The problem isn't you. The problem isn't your situation. The problem is you're hungry and you haven't been eating and the life's been pounding you and coming after you and hurting you and we're trying to live off what we were served weeks ago. But there's no nourishment in it for today. That was for that day. So today you're eating great. Tomorrow you're going to eat? Or you wait till next week? Are you going to eat? Are you going to pray? Are you going to worship? Are you going to serve? Are you going to, are you going to dig into his word? Are you going to eat? Well, I got to work. I know that's a great thing. Please don't quit your job to eat because then you won't eat. <laughs> but you can eat spiritually and work at your job. Well, Scott, I, it's just, it's so hard. Yeah, it's so hard to walk through this life without God. Why would you want to go to him every single day? It's time to eat and eat often. See, it's time to grow in our faith. It's, stop, it's time to stop the cycle. Stop the cycle. Stop it. Stop the, okay, God, I, I'm, 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 I'm trusting you. Oh, God, you're so awesome because you came through in this moment. And the moment that something else happens to you, oh, God, where are you? I can't believe. No, it's time to grow in our faith. It's time to grow in our trust in God. So how do we grow in our faith? How do we grow in our trust of who God is that he will come through? Great question. You want to grow in your faith? You want your faith to grow? Then record your blessings. I believe with all of my heart that the Israelites were talking about the things that, that God had done for them. If they were dwelling on it, if they were talking about it, if it was a part of their everyday life, they're sitting in the tents going, man, man, God's been so good to us. We were slaves, and God started sending these plagues down. Like for six to nine months, plagues were coming after plague after plague after plague. Pharaoh said no, and God's like, oh yeah, watch this. Boom, another one. Boom, another one. Man, God was so faithful. Then we got out of it. We got out of Egypt, and we're walking. We don't know where to go. And he sends a cloud, and he sends fire. Man, every single day, 
a cloud showed up. Every single night, the fire showed up. And then all of a sudden, we have the wilderness, and we have the Red Sea, and we got the Egyptians coming after us. And what did God do? He told Moses to pick up a stick. How dumb was that? And he picks up a stick, and the Red Sea parts, and we walk on dry land. All of a sudden, the ground's dry now, and we're walking through it. Man, that was so cool. God is so good. And the Egyptians tried to follow us, but the ground became muddy again, and they got stuck, and they were walking in the mud, and then God crashed the waves on them, took them out. Man, that was awesome, and we were thirsty, and God gave us water to drink, but it was bitter, and we didn't even like it, so God made it sweet for us. Man, God is so good. Then the moment they get hungry, if they were talking about it, if they were dwelling on it, if they were thinking about it, they go, oh, God came through every single day in a cloud and in fire. He parted the sea. I think he'll feed me tomorrow. See, you want your faith to grow. Remember that God has been faithful. You want your trust to grow and think about the things. Stop, stop, stop reshaping the past so that you're the, be- you're the better part of the story and start telling the truth that God is the only story worth repeating. Not me and who I used to be. I was nothing and I screwed up and I messed up. I don't need to remember all of that. I need to remember who God is, who he was, and who he will always be. See, when you're going through your desert, you need to think about what God has done for you. He saved you if you know him. See, if you don't know him, when I say he saved you, you have to understand you were lost before you encountered Jesus. I spoke for a football team here in town on Thursday. And I, I go in there not as a pastor. They tell them, they tell them, oh, he is a pastor of a church. But I go in there and do a motivational talk. I know you can never see me doing that because I'm so quiet. <sighs> but I go in there and do a motivational talk and I just talk to them about life and I encourage them, give them some biblical principles. And they allow me to pray with them at times. And I, I always stay around at the end and kids are shaking my hand. I'm talking to them and the sophomore comes up, football player, doesn't live too far from here. And he says, Scott, I, here's what's going on at home. Here's what's going on in my life. I don't know if there is a God. I said, have you ever heard the gospel before? Not the word, but like the actual story of Jesus and what he's done. Sophomore in Wichita, Kansas, not too far from here. Never heard of it. Ever heard of Jesus? I heard the name, like, is he the God or something? So let me tell you who Jesus is. Let me tell you the gospel, what I, what I call the gospel, what the Bible calls the gospel, the good news. That you were dead in your sin, you were lost in your sin. Man, you've blown it. Have you made a mistake? Oh, yeah, man, I made huge mistakes. Look, our, our sin, that's what the Bible calls sin, it separates us from God. You're lost in your sin. And Jesus, God in the flesh, the Son of God, came, and he paid your debt on this thing called the cross. You heard about the cross? Yeah, yeah. Well, the blood that he shed there, that was the payment for your sin. Payment, why? Because now you had something separating you from God. There was a debt. Oh, I know what debt is. My parents talk about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's a debt. But Jesus paid your debt. So if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is who he said he was, who did he say he was? He said he was God in the flesh, the Son of God. Okay. If we repent of our sin, what does that mean? Well, it's not just confessing I'm a sinner, it's repenting. So I I turn from how I was living. It's God, forgive me, but be the Lord of my life now. I'm no longer in charge, but you are. I surrender my life to you. In that moment, he saves you. See, for those of us who have experienced that, if he did nothing else for us the rest of our life, that is more than enough to trust him. That is more than enough to love him. That is more than enough to serve him. And if you're here, if you're watching online, you have not experienced that, you can experience that today. And I'm telling you, that would be enough to trust him the rest of your life. But those of you who do know him, who are not lost anymore, You know, he doesn't stop loving you. He takes care of you. He walks with you. He 
comes through for you. For some of you, he literally clothed. For some of you, he literally fed. He brought the right person at the right time when you needed him the most. God has walked with you every step of the way. So when you're in the desert, remember what God has done. And come to his table again and say, God, I know you've been faithful. Can you feed me one more time? I just need enough to get through today. And then go back tomorrow and say, God, you are faithful. Can you feed me one more time? I need enough for today. And what you'll find is eventually you'll get through that desert and you get to the promise. See, God's instruction is there so that he can love you and protect you and care for you. See, once he saves you, he doesn't leave you. He walks with you. He still instructs you, but he cares for you. It's time we stop fighting him and start following him. Stop giving excuses and start saying yes. If you're here today and you're lost, it breaks my heart that a a sophomore here in Wichita had never heard the gospel. But can I tell you, I was at a school last year talking to a team and the same story happened. Well, we're a Christian nation. Are you telling anybody about Jesus? Do you remember who you were before him? Or did you reshape that story so you were cool and everything was great? Do you remember that you were lost and he found you? Maybe you can start telling that story a little bit more. But if you're lost today, know that he will find you today if you just surrender your life to him. And if you're going through a desert, man, he'll feed you. He'll care for you. Just come to him every day. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for loving us, for seeing us, for walking with us. God, we thank you.